Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Chad Haas and Roman Gee. Thanks. Welcome to For Butter or Worse, which um, I kind of thought we would actually have to explain what we meant by butter. Uh, but since they actually called it Project Butter in the keynote yesterday, maybe you're actually on the same slide with us now. Uh, this is Romain Guy. So my name is Romain Guy. I'm the tech lead of the Android UI Toolkit. And I'm Chet Haas on the same team. And we work on graphics and UI and animation and all that stuff. Moving stuff around, which is kind of what this talk is about. It's a bit self-indulgent because we're going to tell you a lot of stuff that we did internally to make the platform better. Um, but it is our subjective and totally selfish belief that understanding more about the architecture and what's actually going on in the platform will help you write better applications. There are three parts to this talk. So the first part is what uh, Chad just mentioned. We're going to explain how things work under the hood. Then we're going to show you a few tools that you can use to identify problems in your application. And based on those, the result of those tools, we'll show you a few tips and tricks you can use in your application to fix those issues. But before we get there, we don't. Wait, I I must say, he took that picture. <laughs> <laughs> he focuses on landscape, and I focus on fattening food products. Uh, we don't like to give a talk here at, at Google and Google I.O. without giving something away. So if you look under your seat, you will find a stick of butter. <laughs> it is not there, because that would be ridiculous. And very gross. So let's define a couple of terms for you. They're kind of opposites, but not quite. There's jank, and there's butter. So jank is about two things. Uh, it's basically discontinuous experiences in the UI. So one is choppy performances, hiccups in animations as they're happening, rendering that's not quite happening fast enough, so the user sees stutters. The other meaning that, uh, that we assign to Jank is discontinuous experiences like a layout sort of relayouting and resizing itself on the screen in front of the user, very discontinuous, very disconcerting. And this is a word we use a lot. So someone yesterday asked a question in the Fireside uh, chat. They wanted to know what skills do you need to work on the Android team. Someone replied, you need to know how to skydive. Well, you also know how to use this word in every sentence. Uh, if you come around the office, it's pretty annoying. You hear jank, 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 jank. I hate that word. Swiping the home screen feels very janky. Yeah, we actually got really tired of this word. On the other hand, it was a nice word to describe exactly what we meant, which was the experience is not good enough. What can we do to make it more? Buttery. So buttery, butter means essentially two things. Uh, smooth performance, which is basically the opposite of that meaning of jank. Let's smooth things out and remove that choppiness in animations and rendering, uh, such as home screen swiping is very buttery in Android 4.1 Jelly Bean. Uh, it also means a fattening spread. We're not actually talking about that meaning today, but there's some Rice Krispie treats right out there, and you can get your dose of it out there. And I have a tip for you. If you take a stick of butter and you smudge it across your screen, you will get free anti-aliasing in all your applications. <laughs> uh, you're joking, but remember uh, uh, The Empire Strikes Back? Remember those big robots at the beginning? Th that was stop motion animation. That's what they did to, make the, to do the motion blur. Because you can see it's usually when they use that technique, you can see it's puppet. Well, they were just smudging, uh, I think, some sort of jelly in front of the camera to make it look blurry and have anti-aliasing. That would have been a lot less effort. We could have spent the last several months doing something else besides actually working on performance if we just had enough butter. Uh, so as I said, we're addressing the first concern of Jank right now, choppy performance. The other is sort of discontinuous UI experiences. Separate problem. This one is all about graphics performance, animation performance, speeding up the platform, as well as tips that you can do to speed up your applications in particular. So for any food product, there's always a recipe. If you want to make butter, you're going to need cream. If you want to make butter in Android, there's essentially two elements that we're talking about here. One is low latency, by which we mean the time elapsed between something happens, like the user touches the screen, and the effects of that action appear on the screen. So the user actually sees the consequences of that action. So what we want to do is minimize latency. At the same time, we also want to speed up frame rate. We want to make these things happen as fast and as continuously as possible so that the user has a continuous experience through user events as they're dragging things along or animations that are happening on the screen during transitions or whatever. So uh, first of all, let's talk about uh, the latency issue. Um, specifically, we'll talk about what we did in the input area. So the overall way 
that input events appear on the screen as consequences of those action is there's a bunch of events. You can picture the, the finger hitting the screen. There's a down action, moves around a bunch. There's a bunch of move events. Eventually, the finger comes up. So there's a pile of events that come in, and then they're asynchronously sort of put into this event queue, and they're batched up, and they're sent over across some wire, and eventually we process those events, and then we draw. And the effects of those drawing are, uh, those drawing operations are eventually seen on the screen by the user. So we flip the buffer, they see the display. So that's the whole process, old and new. This is how things happen. Events come in, we react to it, we draw, user sees the results. So here's a way to visualize the issue. So here we have a screenshot of a Nexus 7, so the device you, you all got yesterday. Uh, and you can see we have an icon in the top left uh, corner of the launcher, and we're just gonna simulate uh, a finger, you know, long pressing on that icon and moving it around. Uh, so we pick up the icon, and then when we move it, that's like latency. You can see that the finger is moving faster than the icon itself. So the difference, the maximum difference between the position of the icon and the position of the finger, that's latency. And latency um, is due to many things. Uh, some of it is introduced by the software rewrite. Some of it is because of the hardware. Uh, it can be the touch screen, it can be the memory bus, it can be many, many things. So we're gonna talk about what we did in our software to reduce the latency that we introduced in the system. Specifically, let's talk about what happened in the input system. So uh, we drew a really complicated diagram. Get used to complicated diagrams, because we're basically talking about complicated things, and complicated things require complicated diagrams with primary colors in them. And here's another tip. You can do what we do and just pretend you understand. So this is not a real situation, but this is essentially what's going on. You can sort of picture the, the green string along the top is a series of input events that are continuously coming into the system. And then occasionally, this is in the pre-Jelly Bean era, uh, we would occasionally batch up the events that were there already, and we'd put them into a queue to await later processing. Eventually, the thread kicks in at the activity level uh, that processes those events that were batched earlier, and then we draw the results, uh, and then we see the results on the screen. And what you're really looking for is when do the things uh, appear to the user, which is basically at the end of that drawing cycle. And you can think about the latency involved in different parts of this system. So, for instance, uh, event A, which is the first one up there, didn't appear, the consequences of that didn't appear to the user until the end of that first draw action, so fairly long latency period. Event C, which happened just slightly after A, also didn't appear till then, right? They were batched up together, and all of them appeared, the results of those actions appeared at the end of the first drawing cycle. And then we go in and we, we batched up further events in the meantime asynchronously, and then they come in and we process those, you know, events D through J, and then they also have these uh, fairly extended latency periods between when the user did something and when the results of that action actually appeared on the screen. So one of the big uh, things that we did to smooth out performance um, in Jelly Bean was to address this system of too many layers of interaction and queues and dispatching operations happening in input. What we really want to do is get the input to the process as soon as possible so that when the user is ready to actually process input events, it gets the latest thing that happens. So we can take a look at the diagram as it actually happens in Jelly Bean. Again, we have this string of events going on. We have vSync. We'll talk about vSync a little bit later, but basically this is the time at which we can actually sort of grab things and process it, um, which is a little out of sync with the way the diagram happens to be drawn. Uh, we are going to come in. You'll notice the blue bars went away, so we no longer have a dispatching operation that bundles these things up and then sends them off into the ether somewhere. Instead, at the time when we process, which is a little proc uh, A through F um, bar in here, we grab all the events at that time. So we're not just stuck with this, you know, the A through C events that happen further away in time. Instead, we can grab every event that happened up to that point. And the net effect is that we have much smaller latencies. The older event may still take a while to actually reach uh, the screen, but you can see the, the newer event that happened right before the process operation appears in a much smaller time period at the end of the draw operation. So what we've got is much better latency overall. And there's a couple of nuances to this. In the old system, it was also possible to really bog down the system. If you were sending in a lot of input events, you could actually bog down the dispatcher, and we would be way, way behind and getting further behind all the time. The other nuance, which they mentioned in the keynote yesterday, uh, was not only are we streaming the inputs to get them there faster, but we're also able to anticipate, in some cases, where the input event should be at exactly the time that we need it. So we go back and we get the most recent input event, and if there is no input event at that specific time, we could plot a little bit of trajectory and say, well, where would an input event be, given the information we have about the few preceding events, uh, such as the finger moving on the screen? And this gives us uh, much more 
uh, much more input events and much more recent input events that we can track things with. And if the best thing to do, we're not showing demos today because it's really hard to show this stuff on the screen, especially with this display technology. Set an ice cream sandwich device next to a jelly bean device and just do the same swiping uh, and launching operations on them and you'll see what we mean, especially with input latency. Uh, and just one thing, on this diagram, the latency, for instance, of uh, input event G looks a lot worse than it actually is. When we measure latency, we measure the number of frames of latency. So here, the D even G has only one frame of latency, and it's really, really, really good. Uh, to give you an idea, like the best devices that you can get today, or the kind of performance we get uh, with Jelly Bean on the Galaxy Nexus, you can expect expect around five frames of latency um, between the time you know your finger uh, causes a reaction from the device until you see the frame that corresponds to this action. I've been talking for a long time. I don't know. I like to listen to you. <laughs> then I'll talk some more. So uh, frame rate is the other one. So reducing latency is good. Also, making the frame rate faster and more consistent uh, is a good thing. And frame rate is all about making the drawing time smaller. So how, how can you actually draw your stuff faster? That's kind of what it's all about, um, but that's not really all there is to it. For one thing, there's a lot of things that go into what we mean by drawing and drawing faster. Um, so we thought it might help. Yeah. yeah? to so, go into an architecture diagram. Yeah, so here's the explanation. Uh, we'll give I'll, you a second. Everybody done? You got it? All right, good. Uh, so moving on, that's how the rendering system works. Um, next topic. Maybe it would help to actually walk through this a little bit, because we're serious. That is the diagram, and you're going to understand it in five minutes, or you have to leave. So there's essentially three parts to the process. Something happens, some event occurs, or an animation event, finger dragon, whatever it is. Something happens that we need to react to. Then we draw, big nebulous box that has a lot of subcomponents to it. And then we hand over control to the surface flinger object to actually get the results of that onto the screen. That's the buffer flipping, it's posting the pixels actually onto the screen, the, the buffer where the pixels are. Um, so let's walk through the different parts of these three processes. And Surface Finger, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's our uh, window compositor. So it takes all the, the windows that are running, that are visible on screen at the same time and makes one single image uh, and then pushes it to the display. So it's not something you interact with directly, uh, but that's what, that's the, the, the window manager and the kind of code rewrite in the UI toolkit to interact with Surface Finger a lot. So the first part of the process, something happens. Uh, so let's say there's an event, the user touches the screen. That will set a property value or propagate the event somehow. Let's say it's uh, you know, setting a translation property on some view, whatever. That causes an invalidate. That's what we mean by something happens, basically. There's an event, we react to it, we set a value, we invalidate, which tells the system, next time we come around to do something, we need to redraw the affected view. And when we say invalidate, we really mean view.invalidate. So it's probably a method that you've used yourself. This is what is happening here. And it's what happens internally as well. When you change something on one of the standard views, we invalidate internally. Very core method. And there's right and way, wrong ways to use it, and we'll get into that later. Okay, now we're into the big part of the process, the bit in the middle that says draw. A lot of different pieces to this. Measure and layout is certainly part of draw. In an optimal situation, if you're in the middle of the animation, hopefully you're not measuring and, and laying out. Lay, layouting? Lay, I layouting? never know, yeah. Uh, doing doing stuff things with layout. That you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Uh, so, but it is a standard part where we come in and do rendering, we say, do we need to do measure and layout, and then we go on to the next step, which is preparing the draw. And, and we have this really poetic name where we DQ a buffer. Um, this is, we talk to Surface Finger, so we have this window compositor, and we ask Surface Finger to give us a buffer in which we can draw. So this is DQing the buffer. And the next step is to update the display list. So as of uh, Android 3.0 in Honeycomb, uh, we started GPU accelerating uh, the Canvas API and a lot of the applications and framework that we run with internally. And this, the way that we did this was by creating these structures called display list, which is an intermediate representation of all the drawing commands that a view does. Right, so we create this display list that uh, the entire view hierarchy basically says, I need to you know, move here, draw this, uh, set a clip rect, all that stuff. And then a display list later is issued into open. And if you want to know more about those two little blue boxes, update display list and display list, you can uh, go to, on YouTube. And we gave a talk last year at Google I.O., a one-hour talk where we talked in detail uh, about display list and how they work and how you should use them. But not now, because we don't have an hour for you to watch that. You can do that later. So we update the display list, and then we draw the display list. 
so now that we have all the information about all the drawing commands that we need to issue, now we go ahead and issue the commands, which is basically a, a process of telling OpenGL, well, draw this line, draw this bitmap, uh, do these operations. And these are both working from this common display list uh, data structure. And then we get to the point where, okay, we've done all our drawings, we're ready to tell Surface Flinger, hey, swap the buffers, I'm done, flip it, get it onto the screen. So then we do the opposite of DQ, we do an NQ, we say, here's our buffer, we're done with it. So once Surface Finger gets the, the, the buffer back from our application, it has to composite all the windows that you see on screen. It does that into a single buffer. Uh, we're simplifying a little bit. Uh, so we, we composite everything into a single buffer, and that's what we display. So compositing windows, uh, we'll talk a bit more uh, about that a little later. So uh, now everybody understands the architecture, yes. right? So it's not that difficult. Uh, but it's important to understand the different stages, so to, to know that we invalidate, then we update the displays, then we draw the displays, then we send our buffer to Surface Finger, because we will see at the end of the talk what you can do to make every one of those steps a little faster. So VSync, uh, we mentioned during the keynote that we introduced VSync uh, on Android. It's not quite true. So for those of you who don't know what VSync is, it's basically the ability to synchronize yourself, your code, with the refresh rate of the display. So typically we talk about 60 hertz. We, we think of displays as running at 60 FPS. So every 16 milliseconds, uh, you get a pulse from the display. That's the VSync. And it says, I'm about uh, to render, and to put a new buffer on screen. And if you manage to synchronize everything uh, with the display, you can get much smoother performance, and we'll, we'll explain how. Um, on Android, um, it's not quite true that the display is always at 60 hertz. It will depend on the device. So some devices will run at, at 55 hertz. Some devices will run at 57 hertz. Uh, the Nexus 7, in particular, runs at 60 hertz. So this is a good device to test on. Um, this can be a good thing. When the display is at 55 hertz, uh, you have a few more milliseconds per frame uh, to, to draw, and you can still be, look really smooth. Um, we talked about introducing VSync, but we've always had VSync uh, on Android. So Surface Flinger itself was synchronized with the display so that we never suffer from tearing. So tearing is an effect that you can see in games sometimes, especially on consoles. When you turn around really quickly, you get this effect where you're seeing at the same time on screen uh, the old buffer, so the last position uh, where you were in the game, and then you see the new buffer coming in, and they're both on screen at the same time because the display is busy you know, refreshing line by line. So to avoid that issue, we had vSync. But now what we do is we also use the vSync pulse to synchronize the logic inside the applications. So we, we synchronize all of our animations, the scrolling, the flings, dispatching the touch events with the vSync to get smoother results. So the process of getting the pixels to the screen, this is more you know, education for you, how do things work so that we can see actually how to optimize it, is basically three steps you can think of this as, first, we're updating the display list, which we saw before. This is generally CPU operations, so this is calling your onDraw method or our onDraw method internally for the standard components. And then we're drawing the display list. This is done on the GPU. We actually call GL draw, and then it queues the things up in the GL queue. And, does its operations on the GPU, and then actually displaying the pixels, flipping the buffer. This is, again, GPU operations to take that buffer and post it to the screen. And then visible is just more of a, a point in time where the user can actually see it, um, which comes in handy when we're gonna talk about uh, how we sped things up to make things visible as consistently as possible. So in the previous platform, in Ice Cream Sandwich, this is kind of how things looked. Is that yes, we used vSync, but we did it at a very low level, which was when we get around to posting the buffer, we post it during the refresh interval, which means there's no tearing on seeing the buffer. However, nothing else in this system was actually working off of vSync. We were just working on event systems that had similar timing behavior, but had nothing really to do with vSync itself. So we would come in at any random time during the frame to actually do our drawing operations. So you can see here, uh, the display at the top, this is the buffer that it's currently showing. So it may be showing buffer zero, which means that we can work on operations for buffer one. So we do our update display list calls on the CPU when we're done with that. Then we pass control over to the GPU uh, to do the actual issuing to OpenGL, and they're both working on buffer one. And then when that's done, then that can be displayed on the next vSync interval. So go into the first frame, display is showing buffer one, life is good. Now, for some reason, there's been a delay before we get around to actually rendering on the CPU and updating the display list again. So we go in and can't draw into buffer two until the very, uh, very near the end of that vSync um, frame, which means that by the time we're done with that and then the GPU operations that follow after it, it's too late. We can't vSync. So what we end up with is jank, right? We basically displayed the buffer, uh, buffer one 
twice in a row, which means to the user, they have seen a hiccup in an animation or a rendering because they saw the same information on the screen for two frames in a, lo in a row. And, and, and um, 16 milliseconds may not seem like a lot of time, and 60 frames per second may seem really fast, but you see two of these. You, you may not know exactly what you saw, but you will notice it. And what's difficult about it is that if you, if you see that kind of issue in your application and you use TraceView or one of our profiling tools, you'll see that your code may be running really fast. Uh, even, even if you take a fraction of a millisecond if, uh, to, to, to execute your draw methods, if that happens across the vSync boundary, you will get that jank, and there's nothing you can do about it. So we fix it for you. Like this. So now we pulse everything in the system related to rendering, animations, grabbing input events, and then the uh, rendering that results from those actions. And we key it all off of vSync. So basically we give ourselves as much time as possible within a frame to finish all those operations, get all the information to the buffer so that by the time we get around to posting the buffer on the next vSync event, we're ready to go. And in this case, there's no jank because in all of these frames, we had the information soon enough that we could actually post the buffer and display the next frame and there was not a hiccup to the user. So now if you're missing frames, it's entirely your fault because you're taking more than 60 milliseconds. Yeah, so yeah, this is not to say, I mean, uh, there's a lot of information and, and you know, advice about how things work here. This is not to say that you can't still jank, obviously. If any of these bars goes longer than 16 milliseconds or if together they take longer than 16 milliseconds, that's a jank too. This is just in a well-behaved application, now that we have vSync, we have a much greater probability of actually having a smooth experience. So display lists, as we said, are, are a core part of rendering with our GPU. It's caching the intermediate rendering commands so that we can then go ahead and issue them very efficiently into OpenGL. So the process that, uh, that this happens with is a bunch of properties will be set. Let's say you're fading in a view and sliding it at the same time. So we're setting some translation and alpha properties on the view. All of these cause their separate invalidates to propagate through the system. And then on the next vSync, we get an event from the vSync pulse that says, okay, time to actually render. So we go through and update the display list that have changed because of these operations. We don't update everything, but we update the views that were changed. And then we draw the display list uh, in its current state. So what we found in this release was there were certain key properties that were being animated over and over again, let's say in launcher going between all apps and the home screen or swiping back and forth, that we could handle much more efficiently by simply setting some properties in a data structure. So we call this display list properties. So rather than on the previous slide, if you're setting alpha and translation properties, instead of recreating the display list for all of the affected views and then redrawing the display list, what we can actually do is simply set some properties that the display list basically grabs on its way to the grocery store. On its way to talking to GL, it says, well, where are you now and what's your alpha value? And then it draws it in there. Much more efficient and there should be a little graph in here. Uh, maybe on the next slide, it'll be very exciting. Um, this is specific to the properties that we added in 3.0, which are the transform properties, uh, translation X and Y, rotate, um, scale, as well as the alpha properties. So if you're setting these properties directly or running object animators or view property animators that are setting these properties, then they will be taking this much more efficient route of simply setting some properties instead of causing the invalidations, which causes time, cost time, as well as the re-rendering of the views that were affected. Um, and, and here's the pretty graph. Yeah, and here's why it matters. Uh, so in blue, you can see the time. So this is taking the example of your in launcher. You click on the All Apps button, and we play an animation to take you to, the, to your list of all the installed applications. So in blue, it's the time we, it, we were taking uh, to run through the Dalvi code of launcher to run all the draw methods on ICS. The red line is the time we take on Jelly Bean. Uh, because it's using uh, display list properties, so now we don't have to run the draw methods of any view in the system. We just go poke at the display list, we can avoid like most of the invalidate work, and then we just start uh, drawing the display list. So in this particular case, we gained about up to two milliseconds per frame, which matters a lot when you're trying to hit a target that's maximum 16 milliseconds. And this was an animation that was specifically either going into all apps or back from all apps. Um, so this is just data that I collected at the time to make sure that I hadn't wasted my time for the past couple of weeks. Um, it, and somebody made the comment at the time, really, one millisecond? You save one millisecond? Does that matter? Think about 60 frames a second. That's 16 milliseconds in which you have to accomplish everything. 
right? Every millisecond counts, especially in something you're gonna run really commonly like this. So yeah, maybe I only saved a millisecond and it was only taking one or two or three, but what if it was doing something more at the time and it was just enough to push it over that 60 frames per second boundary? then we just avoid the jank. And as far as the UI toolkit is concerned, that's a pretty simple animation. We're only changing the scale property and the alpha property. But if you were to change you know, 20 of those properties at the same time, then the, the gains would be much, much higher. Parallel processing. Let's talk about triple buffering. So uh, one of the things that we did um, in Jelly Bean was to enable more uh, parts of the system to work in parallel uh, to give us more um, benefits. If, if you think about it, there's three distinct parts of the system that all need to talk to the GPU at one time. We're, um, we're doing work on the CPU that needs to sort of grab a buffer and have a place to store the information. Then somebody else is going to be doing work on the GPU. They need access to that buffer to get the information that we stored there and then talk to the GPU and say, these are the drawing commands. And then OpenGL is actually doing work to process those commands as well. And then finally, the display system is in queuing and dequeuing and posting the buffers. It needs access to the same information. In the previous system, previous version of the platform, we were double buffered, which is very common, which means I can be displaying a buffer while you're working on it. Well, there's three people at work here, right? So yeah, maybe you're working on it and I'm displaying the buffer, but somebody else is waiting for one of those to free up to do their part of the work chain. Um, so what we did was enable triple buffering um, in, in a, a lazy way where when you need it, uh, it will be there. Uh, so that we can get the low latency that double buffering gives you, but we can also get the consistency that triple buffering can give you, as shown in the following fascinating diagram. So here is a, a very well-behaved application. We're V-sync, so we're drawing at the beginning of the frame, and we can do all the CPU and GPU work in enough time that we're ready for the next um, V-sync interval, which means we're displaying buffer A, B, A, B, A. Life is good. But what if some of these operations took a little bit too long, which means that buffer B doesn't get displayed, doesn't get, uh, we're not finished with buffer B in time to v-sync to it, uh, to flip the buffer, which means that we're gonna see buffer A twice. That's a jank. And then finally, we get around to the next v-sync interval. Finally, buffer A is freed up so that we can operate on it again. And you can see all the wasted time at the end of that second frame where we're just sitting there waiting for buffer A to be free. And again, maybe we take a little bit too long and then we jank again. Right? What we can do instead is allow, allow these things to happen in parallel. So we may still have a jank the first time we took too long to draw, but after that we allocate a third buffer, and that buffer is available immediately. So even though the display is still sitting on buffer A, our CPU operations can actually be working with buffer C at the time because the GPU is busy with buffer B. And all of a sudden there's three pieces that are in play at the same time for the three different components that need them. And we can get, yes, we will have an occasional jank when the system gets into this state, but then we're gonna have much more consistent performance after that. So to improve input latency, we removed the buffer, and to improve uh, frame rate consistency, we added the buffer. That makes no sense to me. <laughs> and, and all of the stuff that we're talking about is actually far more complicated than we're you know, unloading on you today. But these are the sort of high-level concepts behind them. So we, wanted, we mentioned window composition before. I uh, just wanted to explain really quickly how window composition works. So window composition can use both the GPU and something we call the hardware composer. Um, besides the GPU, hardware often has the notion of uh, what we call overlays. An overlay can be seen just as a bitmap, and hardware usually has a limited number of overlays you can use to composite things together without using the GPU. So most of the time what we try to do is we try to use those overlays. We try to put the window of your application inside an overlay. And if we can fit all the windows on screen inside the overlays, the GPU is completely free and we can keep those resources for the apps. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes we cannot use the overlays uh, for all the windows on screen and we have to use the GPU. So you'll see here on the left, we have something called the frame buffers. So instead of sending your window, your drawing into an overlay, we send it to what we call a frame buffer. And then Surface Flinger has to take all those frame buffers composite them together using the GPU, and then send that to an overlay. Um, the problem is that when we use the GPU, it takes time. Like, GPU have a limited number of pixels they can, they can uh, manipulate per second, uh, and anything we do on top of what the application is doing can be a source of problems. So now I want to show you a few tools uh, that you can use in your application uh, to identify uh, frame rate issues uh, and fix them. So the first one is called Dumpsys GFX Info. You have to use a, a command line to use it. So you run ADB shell, Dumpsys GFX Info. But before you can do that, you have to go in the settings application. Um, you go in the developer options, and it's available on your, on your Jelly Bean phone. 
and then at the end, you'll find a, a, an item called profile GPU rendering. So check that, turn that on, then make sure to kill your application first, or at least to kill the window that you want to profile, and then you can run the command. So I'll show you what the result of the command looks like. Uh, I have a Nexus 7 hooked up right here. And I'm just going to scroll a few times in the uh, settings application. And I'm going to output the result. So I'm just scrolling. I'll run the command. So you'll get a lot of information about all the running processes. If you want, you can specify the name of your process uh, to eliminate a lot of information. Um, we mentioned this tool in other talks uh, if you want to know, to, to know more about the other information. But what matters is those three columns of data that you see here. Uh, so you find the three columns. And what you will do is just grab all this data, copy and paste it into a spreadsheet. And then you will get a result like this one. One sec. So this is the data you can graph. So here I just create a stack graph. So every bar contains the sum of the three columns. So the first column on the left uh, in that data that we output is the time it takes to update the display list on every frame. The middle column is called process display list. It's the time we take to draw the actual display list. And the last one is the time uh, we take to swap the buffers, so to give the buffer back to Surface Flinger. So here, uh, when I was scrolling through settings, you can see that when we do the sum of all those, those, uh, those, those data, um, we are well below the 16 millisecond limit. So this app is running at 60 FPS. We're v-synced. Everything is going great. And you can see that most of the time, uh, you should be spending uh, most of the time in process display. So drawing, executing the display should be uh, where you spend the bulk of the time. The blue part is the, your code. So when you write your, your Java code, your on-draw method, that's in the blue bar at the bottom. Uh, and this is where you can do most of the optimizations. Next, uh, I wanted to show you SysTrace. So SysTrace was mentioned several times. Uh, if, you were the, if you attended the tools talk uh, earlier today, you, will, you, you saw what it looks like. It was mentioned during the keynote. Uh, and I wanted to show you how you can use it to identify issues. So let's imagine that you have an app that's misbehaving. You can use SysTrace to understand what's, what in the system is making your, ha your app misbehave. So first of all, you have to enable SysTrace. So you go back to developer options and settings. And then look for something called enable traces. You'll get a little dialogue. Uh, and here you can see the type of information that you want to trace. Uh, in this particular case, we're only interested in, to, in uh, graphics performance. So we're going to select graphics and view. Um, there is a lot more you can use if, you, if you're doing audio processing or video playing. You can uh, enable that. Now, using the tool once you have that enabled is very simple. So you go back to your terminal. Let's remove this. And I'm just going to uh, capture a trace while scrolling through settings. So the same test as I just did with the uh, DOMSYS GFX info. So all you, oh yeah, you have to go in the, in the SDK, you have to go in the directory called, called uh, tools slash systrace. In there, you'll find a Python script called systrace.py. Uh, so you run that. And while it's running, uh, just make your app react. So here, I'm just scrolling the, the list view in settings. Captures a trace for five seconds. Yes. So you get an HTML file. I'm going to open. And this is the result. Uh, so this gives you an overview of everything that's going on in the system uh, at the time you took the trace. In very so, comforting pastel colors. Yeah. Um, so it's very interesting because here you can see how many CPUs were active uh, when I started the trace. Um, this is a quad-core device, but I needed only one CPU to get the job done. So we can see only that, that only one CPU is active. And if I zoom in on it, uh, so the UI is a little complicated. You have to use, uh, if you like, uh, you know, Doom or Quake games on PC, you use WASD. It's the same keys to navigate uh, in the tool. Uh, we're going to get a better <laughs> UI, I hope. Uh, so we zoom in on the CPU, and you can see exactly what the CPU was doing. So for instance, here, if I click on it, I can see that settings, the settings application, was doing something for about two milliseconds. Uh, you can see that next we had uh, something called binder, so a binder thread that was doing something for a tenth of a millisecond. Uh, so it's a really powerful tool because you can see, you can get a lot of the details about the system. Um, and the important part when you, when you want to improve performance in your application is to look at the, at the process called Surface Finger. So remember, Surface Finger is in charge ultimately of putting your pixels on the screen. And what we're, we are capturing here, every bar that you see is basically one frame. Um, and you can see here, everything is very regular. So we're posting our frames on the vSync 
uh, at about 60 FPS. And the only two pauses that we see here is because I, was, I just reached the end of the list when I was calling it, so I, you know, for a fraction of a second, the time it took me to start going the, the other direction, nothing was happening. You can also zoom in on your application, and here you can see the graph we are talking about. Um, so deliver input event, this is where we receive the, the touch events, this is where we deliver the touch events to all your views, this is where you run your own code if you intercept touch events. And then we have this perform traversals method. Uh, this is where we draw, this is where we dequeue the buffer, so we get a buffer from surface finger. Um, then get display list, this is uh, what we call update display list in the diagram. So here we spent about 1.2 millisecond going through the views in the UI toolkit, asking them to recreate their display list. So it was very fast. Then draw display list, this is where we execute the display list, and you can see it took only 2.3 milliseconds. And then we swap buffers and we give the, the buffer back to surface finger. When we are done, <clears throat> if you look at the surface finger process, you can see that we finished our work and at the next vsync, surface finger takes our buffer and then posts it on screen. Um, so this example, I mean, just shows you how to use the tool. It's pretty simple. Um, you can do multiple selection to see everything that's happening, you know, in a given period of time. What's more interesting is to look at the tool when things go wrong. So I won't show you the application, but I wrote a little application. It's a simple list view that's doing something bad. Um, and so when you scroll the list, it's very janky, it's very choppy. Uh, and we're going to look at the output of SysTrace uh, to try and understand what was going on. Um, so let me find the trace. Not this one. There we go. So it looks the same, but already when you look at surface finger, you can see that um, all, the, all the, the frames that we post, it's not regular anymore. We have those big gaps. And if we zoom in on the application I was running, you can s and we look for drawing, so here we're drawing, you can see that we're spending only four milliseconds drawing. So the app should be smooth. The problem is not in our drawing code. But if you look uh, at what's happening between two frames, we see this huge block called deliver input event. So because it's a list view and I was calling it with my finger on screen, that means we were spending time in the dispatching of the touch events. And in the case of a list view, uh, we call the adapter method called getView while you're scrolling the screen. So chances are that's where we're spending most of our time. And here we can go a little further. If we zoom in on, on this block here, uh, there's a tiny bar. Maybe it's hard to see, but you can see the state of the thread. So here at the beginning, for about five milliseconds, um, my process was running. I was actually running code. And then after that, it's blank. That means that my thread was waiting on something. The, the, my process was sleeping. So what we can do is go all the way to the top and look at the CPU and see what the CPU was doing at the time. And here we can see that uh, a thread called binder1 was doing a lot of work. Um, at the bottom, you can see the thread ID for binder1. Uh, and then you can go back to the shell and using ADB shell PS, so where you can see all the, the processes running, and PS-T to see all the threads running, you can identify that thread. And in this particular case, uh, the thread was identified uh, as a thread that belongs to the, pro to the context process. And it was slow because my application was making a query uh, for the content provider of context between t between, uh, in, in GetView uh, every other frame. So that's what, that's what was blocking the application. Um, and usually when you see, when you identify an issue like this, um, you can stop using SysTrace and then you can use TraceView. Uh, so how many of you uh, have used TraceView before? Just raise your hand. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, everybody should use TraceView. Um, that means you either don't care about performance or your application is awesome, in which case, f congratulations. <laughs> I wish all my applications were that good. Uh, let's see. So it's a, it's a trace I captured in the same application, uh, but you can invoke uh, TraceView pretty easily yourself from DDMS or Eclipse. Uh, so this is what it looks like. I won't go into too much details. Uh, here, when you see a blank spot, uh, when you see a, yeah, a blank section in TraceView, it means that your thread, your application was not running. So if you see one of the things, you can go in SysTrace, and SysTrace will tell you what's going on uh, elsewhere in the system. So we've already identified that we are waiting on, a, on this binder one. We're waiting on the contacts process. And if we look at this block and we navigate through the, the parents, we can see that we were doing a content resolver query. Uh, in my list activity, uh, I have something called the slow adapter that makes it easy to find the bug. Uh, so in the getView method, I was doing a query, I was calling a query, and we were spending about, oops, sorry, we were spending about 
52 milliseconds per call was spent doing the query. So obviously I should stop querying the database on every frame. So there's, there's an interesting relationship between TraceView and SysTrace. Actually, TraceView kind of inspired um, at least my desire for something like SysTrace, which fortunately people wrote. That was great. Uh, because sometimes you look in TraceView and you say, well, actually my stuff is not taking very long, but in the middle of a method call which I know for sure is not doing anything, my thread is just swapped out and there's something else going on in the system maybe regularly. And SysTrace allows you to see what that other thing is that's happening. Maybe you have a service running somewhere that is syncing on a regular basis and basically stealing CPU cycles away from you. So they're both useful in their own way. We don't do the per method tracing in SysTrace. It's more a, a, to get a system-wide overview of what's going on. TraceView is really um, important to use to see what's actually going on in the methods of your So and all the vsync and triple buffering work uh, was made possible thanks to SysTrace. Uh, so just a reminder, so SysTrace by default will capture five seconds of traces. You can change that. There's a command line argument you can use. It will output a, a, an HTML file. Um, so the UI is not that great right now, but we'll improve that. And uh, the, the, the benefit of the HTML file is that you can add, attach it to a bug report. You can send it by email. You don't need a special tool to visualize it. You just open the HTML file in Chrome, uh, and you're good to go. Um, so I mentioned before window composition, and I, I made the distinction between uh, the, the GPU composition in, in, with frame buffers and overlays. So you can use a tool called Dumpsy Surface Flinger to see the state of overlays and frame buffers in the system. So if you run that command, and I'm not going to run it because uh, we're running out of time, uh, you're going to see you're going to get a huge amount of logs, and somewhere towards the end, you're going to see a little table that's going to list all the windows currently visible on screen and whether or not they are in overlays. So here I wrote a, a simple application, the same application I showed you in, in SysTrace, and you can see that uh, we have the status bar and we have the navigation bar at the bottom with the home button and the back button, uh, and everything is in an overlay. So everything's great. We're not using the GPU for the window composition. Uh, you have access to, to, to the entire GPU inside your application. Now, if I modify the application to invoke uh, a pop-up window, um, then we, we're, we're running out of overlays. That was on the, on the Nexus 7. And when we run out of overlays, we have to revert to, back to GPU composition. So suddenly, I have three windows that are in frame buffers. So the time it takes to composite the three windows together is taken away from my application. So here, if I see that in my application, and I need you know, that particular screen to be really fast, you should think about whether or not you need that extra window. Like Maybe you could uh, turn that window into a view in the main activity. Uh, now, be very careful when you use this tool, Dumpsy Surface Flinger, uh, because we have a special optimization. After the application is done drawing, everything reverts back to overlays. So make sure that you run this command as the application is drawing. So when you're scrolling, when there's an animation going on. The other, what do you mean the other way around? Uh, sorry, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm glad that we have a surface finger uh, guy in the room. It reverses to frame buffers when you're done drawing. Uh, and there's, there's a good reason for that, it's basically to save battery. Um, so take away, make sure that your application is drawing when you're running the command, or the information you're going to get is not going to be very useful. Uh, that's what I just said. Um, so a few other tools you should use. So TraceView, we just, we just saw TraceView. Uh, Hierarchy Viewer, for those of you who don't know uh, what this tool is about, um, you can check out the documentation on developer.android.com. And uh, if you are not aware of it, this tool will not work. It's very useful to debug your UI, but it will not work on retail devices. So if you go to the store and buy a device, Hierarchy Viewer will not work. So uh, on GitHub, I put a little um, library called View Server. It's one class, one Java file that you put in your project. Just read the documentation. You have to add uh, about two lines per activity to make it work. That will enable the use of Hierarchy Viewer in your application. Uh, so github.com slash romangi slash view server. Uh, Tracer for OpenGL, yes. Uh, if you're writing OpenGL applications, you can take a look at it. Uh, if you're using hardware acceleration in your application and your frame rate is choppy, you can take a look at Tracer for OpenGL, yes, to identify what view is taking uh, so much time. Um, there was a demo of it uh, earlier today. Allocation tracker. How many of you have used allocation tracker before? Well, that's awesome. It's, the number is increasing every year. I like that. Um, so it's funny because as I was taking the screenshot uh, a couple weeks before we finished Jellybean, I identified an allocation that the framework was doing several times per frame. I don't know where that came from. Well, that's okay. We were just allocating dozens of uh, exceptions and all their strings per frame. <laughs> It was so, yeah. exceptional coding. It's good that we have tools. I mean, we have two types of tools, this one and this one.
All right, now the part that you're probably most interested in, uh, tips and tricks, what can you do in your application to, to solve the problems that you identified with the tools? So these are the things that you can fix. You can uh, make the frame rate more consistent. You can lower the latency. You can in increase the speed of uh, uh, drawing display list. You can increase the speed of updating display list. And finally, you can free up the GPU for uh, your own application. So first one is about allocations related to the allocation tracker. Um, yeah, yeah, so how many of you have used this keyword before? OK, Come some on. seem to know how to use it. Uh, the best way to use it, in fact, is like this. Um, don't use this uh, in particular. I mean, obviously, we need to allocate objects. Don't do it during an animation or during your inner loop or during performance-sensitive uh, operations or methods. Um, because basically, even though that, that looks like a really small temporary object, it may take up significant time actually creating the object. And more importantly, it's, it creates garbage that will have to be collected at some point in time. We put a fair amount of effort, um, besides that previous bug that we were talking about, uh, into making sure that we are not doing allocations in the middle of our animation routines or our rendering logic because we don't want to cause jank in the middle of an, an of an animation. And one of the ways that that happens regularly is by creating little bits of garbage here and there. And then in the middle of that 500 millisecond animation, you're going to pause for four milliseconds, which may be enough to shove you over the frame barrier. So avoid allocating if you can. There's various techniques for this transient static objects that you use, um, pass around or whatever. But uh, try to avoid it when you need to. This will give you more consistent frame rate overall because basically you avoid those hiccups. So the next uh, big thing you can do is stop writing code. Just do as little as you can. It's pretty obvious, uh, but we had a great example in one of our applications uh, that shipped on Jellybean. We identified a performance issue. And what was happening was, um, in the get view method, uh, it was first it was creating an object, but at the constructor in that object was doing about 200 string comparisons. Uh, and we were actually spending most of our time doing the string comparisons instead of drawing or doing the layout. Um, and you know, it looks innocent when you write the code, and, and you know, over the years, like, uh, your code will be used in different places or differently than you intended it to be. Uh, so be very careful, use trace view, use sysTrace. Uh, if you do so, you're going to improve the consistency of the frame rate, and you're going to lower latency. Choreographer is a new class that was introduced, new API that was introduced around vSync capabilities. Most of its capabilities are actually under the hoods. It's basically the, the logic in charge of making sure that everybody's actually running on that uh, vSync pulse, the animations, the input events, and the rendering stuff. So you don't typically talk to choreographer directly, but you can. If you're using the system in an atypical way, uh, then you can actually link into the vSync system that everybody else. And just like with the tools we showed you, Choreographer, that's what we use in the platform. So all the vSync work we've talked about, that's what the UI, the UI toolkit uses Choreographer to make it happen. And the, the way that you would hook into this, actually you hook into it automatically just through using the mechanisms of the platform. If you're using animators, those animators are actually running on the vSync pulse provided by Choreographer. You don't need to do anything. But if you're doing something else, if you're doing your own you know, custom runnable animations that are getting posted later, you can hook into the same vSync pulse by calling methods such as the new post and validate on animation. And post and validate on animation uh, and this one post on animation are available in the support library. So on previous versions of the platform, they will behave just like a normal post runnable or post and validate. And on Jellybean, you'll automatically benefit from the vSync. And there's also a way to get uh, to register a callback that gets called on the next frame. All of these are one-shot deals. You basically post the request, you get a callback, and then if you want to be called back on a regular basis, you would post another one. So this one in particular, uh, post-frame callback, if you're writing a game or some OpenGL animation, this is probably what the, the, the API you want to use. It, it's completely independent from Vue. Um, so just take a look at it and, and use it. I think this one, though, is not in the, the support library. So using Choreographer helps give you that consistent frame rate because now everything in the universe is actually synced on that same vSync pulse for obvious and wonderful reasons. And lower latency because then you're reducing the amount of time that you're actually spending in the frame. You're doing things as soon up front during the refresh uh, frame as possible. 
Layers, uh, use hardware layers. We talked about layers uh, a lot last year, so if you go back to our uh, Google I.O. 2011 talk, Android uh, Accelerated Rendering? Accelerated Android, uh, what? Anyway, a yeah. talk we gave last year. Yeah. Uh, we went on and on and on about uh, layers. Uh, so if you want to know more about layers, uh, go watch that talk. Uh, basically, what you want to do if you're writing animations and you're using the view property animator, uh, so first of all, the view property animator has tons of optimizations under the hood that we cannot apply with normal animations, uh, so you get a lot of benefits from using it. And we introduced, uh, well, Chet introduced a new API this time around called with layer. So we will automatically set up a layer on your view at the beginning of the animation, and we will remove the layer at the end of the animation. So do not go wild and use with layer on any view. Try to do that on large views or complex views that have tons of children. Uh, but don't do that on a button or just a simple text view. Yeah, so uh, consistent frame rate, faster displays drawing. Clipping. Uh, clipping is very important. The UI Toolkit does a lot of clipping for you. Uh, it's one of the biggest optimizations that uh, we have, and it's one of the biggest optimizations that you have at your disposal when you're writing custom code. So the first part of clipping is, to, uh, is about um, doing proper invalidations. So it's very tempting when something changes in the view to just call view.invalidate. It's easy. It works. Now, what we want you to do is call uh, invalidate and tell us what part of the view really needs to be redrawn. Because uh, if you do so, uh, we can avoid a lot of work. So if you call invalidate on a view, so let's say we have a, a, the view at the top, uh, that's the, the tree of, of displays for the view and its children, uh, and we call invalidate, we'll have to redraw everything. Uh, it's a lot of work, and in the case of a list view, for instance, or a complex view, it can take a lot of time. Now, if you do an invalidate uh, with a specific region, what we can do is we can reject uh, views or display lists that are outside of this, of this dirty rectangle, and we do a lot less work. Um, and in, in, in very complex applications, when you have hundreds of views, uh, it can be very, very important because we're going to do that rejection work as early as possible in the tree so we can uh, get rid of most of the views and just ignore them completely. So uh, if, if you're spending too much time uh, updating this playlist or drawing this playlist, you can uh, do that. Uh, and if you want to know uh, if you're doing things right, uh, go to developer options. There is a new option called show uh, GPU view updates. If you turn that on, uh, I hope you're not epileptic. Uh, the system is going to flash in red really quickly uh, the, region of the, the regions of the screen that we redraw. Uh, but it's very useful to see exactly uh, what your application is doing. Uh, so this is a tip that came out of uh, one of the applications that we were working on during Jelly Bean. That's, um, well, Google Now. Uh, yes, that one. So we're a 2D API. We have no idea the structure of your application. All we know is the rendering commands that you give us. So if you have a view that's really complex and you're drawing lines and text and bitmaps and all this stuff in the view, and then you have another view that's drawn directly on top of it, well, we're going to draw the first one, and then we're going to draw the second one, and the user is not going to see most of what we spent that time drawing for the first view because it's covered by the second view. So the idea here is you have that information about your activity. We don't. Well, you can tell us about it, right? So you can actually tell us the information about what's being clipped out. So basically, don't waste our time trying to draw that stuff if it's not going to show up to the user anyway. So in this case, there are two cards here. The first one, you only see that header information. And the second one, you see uh, all of the content in it. So maybe in the first one, you could actually just tell us, you know what? Don't draw the stuff beyond here because we're going to, you're going to waste your time doing that anyway. So the red region that we're showing here is the overdraw. It's the time that we wasted drawing all this information that didn't appear to the users. So the easiest way to do this is to simply tell us to clip out that information. So you know that you're being displayed with something else on top of you. You're only in header mode where you only want to show the stuff at the top. Set a clip rect and then go ahead and draw your content. Now you're going to spend a little bit of time drawing that content. Um, so maybe the simpler logic is, you know, that's okay, you are spending a little bit of time, but in the meantime, you've given us a really important piece of information that when we go to talk to OpenGL and say, render the following commands, we're going to check it against the clip rect and we're going to clip reject it immediately and just get rid of that information without actually bothering to render it. So again, you set the clip rect here, and we're not drawing the rest of the stuff in it. We're just drawing that header, and then we draw the other thing on top of it. And it gave this one application a big performance boost, because they had several of these stacked cards, and they were basically wasting a lot of time drawing information that never appeared to the user. So make the display list issuing much faster by simply not uh, having us do stuff that really doesn't matter. And you can go even further. If you use clip rect, uh, there's a method on Canvas called quick reject. 
uh, you, you pass a rectangle, and the method will tell you whether or not that rectangle will be visible on screen uh, at, when it comes time to draw. Uh, so this is what we use a lot inside the UI toolkit to know whether or not we have to draw a view. But if you set your own clip rect, you can avoid running extra code uh, in your application by just checking the state of the clip rect. So for instance, here we have a list of items. We've set a clip rect. Um, and we can check whether uh, each item will be visible or not. If the item is not visible, we can skip it entirely. So we're going to avoid doing extra work running you know, Java code that will generate drawing commands that we'll have to enqueue in our display list, and so on and so on. Uh, our display list have a lot of optimizations around clipping. Uh, we're going to try to do clipping ahead of time uh, so that we don't have to do it on every frame. Uh, but by doing this, you're going to avoid running extra Java code, which uh, can matter a lot. So if you do a quick reject, you're going to make your displays drawing faster, and updating displays will also be faster. So this is an optimization that uh, came out of another application that shipped on the device. Uh, this came from the Contacts application, uh, where they were having a janky experience when animating one of these cards. You'd click on the icon, the thumbnail, and it would animate up. Uh, and you'd get this nice experience where you, know, you see the activity below, and then you get this sort of translucent, dim thing uh, on top of that, and then you get the contact in full view. And when it was just static, it was great. When it was animating into view, it was horrible. And we used SysTrace and looked at what was going on in Surface Flanger to see where the hiccups were coming from, and it turns out it was coming from dim window. Uh, so if you set um, an attribute on Window Manager on the layout params, you say dim behind, then basically the thing behind your current window will dim, you'll get this nice translucent effect, and it's great if all you're doing is looking at this statically. But if you're actually running a lot of code at the same time, in this case the contacts application was running an animation in the view on top, then basically you're asking the GPU to do a lot of work because you're shoved into that frame buffer versus overlay situation. Right, so all of a sudden now we have the GPU compositing frame buffers together to put them into an overlay to get composited onto the screen. And at the same time, you're doing a lot of work on the GPU just to draw your application because you're trying to animate this thing in at the time. Uh, there was a very easy fix to this. It was a very non-obvious problem until we looked at SysTrace uh, output and saw what was going on. But there's fortunately a very easy fix. Don't use dim window if you're running into this sort of uh, situation, especially when running an animation on that thing on top. Instead, you can simply set a background that is the color or the translucent color that you need. You can th get the exact same uh, visual effect without actually introducing that extra window into the hierarchy that tossed everything into frame buffers and caused the problem to begin with. Um, so in this case, you're going to get faster display list drawing because we're simply not doing as much stuff uh, in parallel with the surface flinger also doing stuff on the GPU. And again, you'll get faster composition. So I think the takeaway here is obviously, especially in America, with Wait, our love of food. I, I, I have to say, this slide in is entirely his fault, OK? I will take the credit. I, I'm OK with that, because I have to own it. Spread the word. <laughs> Thank you. If you want to know more about performance and rendering and graphics, uh, check out our Google I.O. 2011 talk. And you can also go on uh, parlis.com where we have a bunch of talks, videos, and slides uh, where we, we also touch those subjects. And we have exactly two minutes left for Q&A. So if you have a question, walk up to the mic, uh, and we'll try to answer it. And we'll probably be, we're going to be doing, uh, watching some talks this afternoon, though, otherwise in and out of Android office. Oh, hours. and uh, you should go to the next session by Jeff Sharkey. You yes. will learn even more about performance. Yes. Uh, so one question is, I got a list view with a ton of images. They're drawing, and I think that uh, the drawing of those bitmaps are slow. And so I have two questions. Number one is, is there a way? I heard that compressed textures are faster to draw, but I have bitmaps that I'm passing as bitmap drawables to an image view. Is there any way to use compressed textures there? Uh, no, no, we won't be able to use compressed, uh, compressed textures. Uh, how big are your drawables? How big uh, are the images? They're 256 by 256 so, bitmaps. So that shouldn't, page, that, that shouldn't be an issue. The issue is probably somewhere else. Are, uh, uh, so one question, too, is are, you, are they drawing at that size, or are you scaling them into a uh, different size? They're at that size. OK. So that, that's, I would say it's almost definitely not the issue. Uh, um, well, so it's definitely also like loading those bitmaps, especially as JPEGs. And unfortunately, there's like thousands of them potentially on a page. So I was wondering if I could store them as compressed textures and then load them directly to you guys. Yeah, you won't be able to do that, but use SysTrace and TraceU, and you'll be able to figure, it out, figure out what's going on. I really doubt that the, the issue is drawing.
I've, I think given 30 seconds, I, I think we're out of time. We should probably get off the mics. Thank you.